Okay, hello everyone and welcome. Um, I'm Christine Van Campen, CHD's Vice President of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion. And we're thrilled that you took time out of your busy schedules to join us today. Um, on behalf of our co-sponsor, Healthy Careers, we're thrilled to be holding this important discussion about DEI and to learn about some best practices you can implement in your organization. If you are a member of AAPPR, this webinar also counts as a continuing education credit for your CR CPRP certification. So as you know, we've seen in recent years, uh, many organizations around the country taking steps to create more inclusive workplace cultures. Uh, we've seen some organizations expanding on their already robust programs, while others are still just getting started. And today we're excited to really dive into some practical ways that DEI initiatives can be enacted in order to affect meaningful, meaningful change, regardless of where you are in your journey. To that end, we've assembled a wonderful panel of experts today who bring tremendous experience and insight related to implementing DEI initiatives in healthcare. Um, let's meet them now. So panelists, please join me. All right, first we have uh, Hannah Chady. Hannah is uh, the Director of Phys Physician Talent Management at Emory Healthcare in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, prior to working at Emory Healthcare, Hannah was the Director of Physician Relations at Jackson Hospital, where she oversaw all programs related to physician recruitment and spearheaded the launch of a new medical school campus on behalf of the hospital and also served as a liaison. She was active in the community and volunteered her time with several organizations, including the Air War College, Junior League, Emerge Montgomery, Family Justice Center, and Montgomery Humane Society. Um, Hannah, welcome, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Great. And I'm... Perfect. All right. Um, next, we have Jessica Reynolds. Uh, Jessica is Candidate Experience Manager at ChenMed and has more than 12 years of experience in healthcare recruitment. She manages the recruiting and onboarding process for ChenMed in Tennessee and Missouri. Um, ChenMed is the largest family-owned physician-led primary care provider with a 100% model base of value-based care dedicated to rescuing seniors and geriatric patients in more than 100 centers nationwide. Uh, Jessica became an active AAPPR member in 2018 and currently sits as the co-chair of the AAPPR Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Advisory Committee. Jessica is also a proud graduate of Jackson State University with a bachelor's degree in criminal justice and a minor in juvenile justice. Jessica, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. It's wonderful having you here. And finally, we have Russ Peel. Um, Russ serves as the Director of Workforce Recruitment and Retention for the Veterans Health Administration, the nation's largest integrated healthcare system, comprised of 170 medical centers and over 1,000 community-based outpatient clinics, serving over 9 million enrolled veterans each year. In his role, Russ provides strategic direction and executive oversight for the agency's national efforts to recruit, ret retain, and develop its most critical patient care and clinical support occupations. Russ is credited with establishing VHA's first in-house specialized physician provider recruitment division and successfully leading the largest specialty recruitment and hiring initiative in its history. He has over 25 years of direct experience in the profession in both the private and public sectors and is a principal leader in the VA's workforce diversity recruitment and talent pipeline development efforts. He is a member of the American College of Healthcare Executives an executive in government fellow with the Partnership for Public Service. And Russ is also a board member of the AAPPR and the executive champion of its Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Advisory Council. Russ, welcome. Thank you very much, glad to be with you. Well, thank you so much. And thank you all panelists uh, for joining us. I know I'm really excited to learn from you and, and hear about the insights that you're going to share with all of us today. Um, for our audience, just a few housekeeping items. If you do have questions as we go, please use the Q&A feature um, icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We will try to get to as many questions as we can. Um, we'll save time at the end of the presentation to address your questions. So please don't hesitate 
to pop in and let us know if you have something you'd like to hear from our panelists about. We will also be recording our webinar and we will mail it to everyone that has registered. So we look forward to you sharing that with your, within your organizations. So with that, let's get started. Um, so today our focus is to discuss practical ways that healthcare organizations can implement impactful DEI initiatives. Um, and let's start at a, a pretty high level by discussing organizational cult structure. That's, that's becoming a more interesting topic as I go out and talk with other DEI practitioners in the space. Um, Jessica, I'd like to start with you. So based on your experience, where do you believe DEI should live within an organization and why? Well, I think that DEI needs to live within the entire organization, but I think it's really important for it to be represented in the C-suites and the V-suites. You know, people need to see the representation in the leadership role so they know that there is opportunity there and they know that the diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts are genuine. Um, you know, working as a recruiter, a lot of times, you know, I hear conversation about how do we get the buy-in within the organization? You know, if it's at the workforce level, it needs to be, you know, a message that's within the entire enterprise and organization. So I think it's very important for the leaders and the executive teams to have clear messaging, to have champions and people who are really living, breathing, and really implementing initiatives that can be actionable and seen across the entire organization. Um, if that is not the case, you know, it usually tends to, you know, fizzle out because it doesn't, it doesn't have any backing behind it. Yeah, I appreciate you sharing that. Um, I, I would agree with your assessment of that. I, I'd love to hear from our panel, our other panelists, Russ or Hannah, anything you would add in terms of successful organizational structure or design that you've seen in your work? Yes, I would just add to kind of what Jess said, uh, it, it really needs to be a, an executive uh, strategic imperative. Uh, in order for anyone in the organization to take it seriously or begin to posture themselves for buy-in. Uh, and whether or not those goals are aspirational or not, it needs to be something clearly uh, uh, based out of the C and B suites and that everyone in the organization understands it's, it's a business imperative. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Hannah, any thoughts you would add around structure? Yeah, I mean, just echoing what um, Jessica and Russ said, um, certainly needs to be seen as an initiative coming from the top down, um, but all of the departments throughout an organization need to be bought into the concept as well. It can't just be um, something that is like, you know, we're going to do this today and, you know, kind of the flavor of the month and um, yay, we're proud to be an organization that's supporting um, an initiative that might be getting global attention or national attention due to you know, whatever is occurring um, at that time. So it has to be um, something that's ingrained in the culture of the organization. And that has to be not just from the C-suite, but certainly from every um, department and every person in the organization must feel like it's a part of the culture. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think we're all on the same page. I mean, there, there has to be real clear buy-in and support from the top of the organization. Um, I know for myself at CHG, and I think for each of you, we have, um, we have that kind of support in our organizations, um, but I know not everybody does. Do any of you have any tips on how those can gain buy-in from the C-suite um, if they don't already have that? I think what you can do to gain buy-in from the C-suite is present them with the data, show them statistics and analytics on, you know, the revenue that they can generate, you know, what they're losing when they don't have a diverse workforce. When you show them where the money is going and the opportunities they're missing, then I think it will open their eyes to the importance of it not just being, as Hannah stated, the flavor of the month. It needs to be a long game strategy within the entire organization moving forward. I couldn't agree more. I think that the C-suite loves to see the numbers and um, certainly with the revenue increase that always um, is a enticing uh, strategy. Absolutely. 
So I, um, let's build on that. So of course, along with bu needing buy-in from the C-suite, um, it is important, you know, a couple of your reference, not getting caught up in making what could be seen as symbolic gestures um, or performative DEI efforts. And we all know that those can ultimately undermine the impact and, and effectiveness of your true DEI initiatives. So Russ, I'd love to have you talk to us a little bit about some of the suggestions and best practices that you have for our audience around developing an authentic commitment to DEI. Thank you, and, and, I, and I, I think it's also important to kind of begin uh, responding to this where uh, by noting that this C-suite approach to uh, diversity and inclusion in a very real way, it could be a, a cultural transformation for a healthcare system. And it may counter, let's say, cultural norms. It'll take a whole lot of courage for, or for, or for executive and C-suite folks to kind of present and promote it. Um, but I think what's really important when it comes to uh, uh, authenticity from performative is number one, how we communicate uh, our imperative, how we communicate uh, this initiative. It's a long game strategy. And that all everyone kind of noticed uh, this time, this last year, two years ago, everyone, as you pointed out at the beginning, were in a hurry to really demonstrate that they were engaged in diversity, equity, and inclusion. And, uh, and like Jeff said, some of those efforts really fizzled out at major corporate levels. So communicating to every level of the organization and from the top of the organization is, is a cultural business imperative and we're very serious about this is number one. Number two, uh, uh, involvement and engagement. Uh, one of the things that we did here is once we laid out our strategic and business diversity, equity, and inclusion imperatives, we went to every level of the uh, organization to include even employees that had been brought on a year or less to, to, to get their input, their perspective, and what does a diverse organization look like? What is an inclusive corporation looks like through your lens and begin framing our action plan from those who are already in our space uh, uh, from their input. Uh, and lastly, uh, after you've laid out some pretty actionable, tangible goals, uh, be very intentional about transparency, uh, making sure all of the information, uh, all the milestones reached, uh, all of the gains accomplished are widely publicized widely celebrated, that, that is a key part of transforming a culture uh, to not only getting buy-in or leading with the buy-in from the executive level, but actually creating more uh, interest and buy-in from the uh, members of the organization that are kind of on the phrase, oh, let me see how long this is going to last, if it's going to fizzle out after three months. So I really begin to invest my energy in this. If they get a sense that the organization is authentic, intentional, and transparent, we begin the right approach to making inclusion and diversity a, a real highlight of our, our, our corporate footprint. Well, those are great, great responses, Russ. Um, it, you got to put some sweat equity in, right? You got to roll up your sleeves. And to, to our earlier discussion, it's critical to have C-suite buy-in, but you can't stop there. You, you really do have to roll up your sleeves and connect with every level of the organization to understand what's important to them. And, and how do you address their needs as well? So they see themselves in the work also. Re really great recommendations. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to open it up, Jessica, Hannah, anything you would add in terms of steps you've seen be successful around creating an authentic DEI approach versus performative? I'm going to piggyback off of Russ uh, when he, he was expressing being intentional and being very transparent with the messaging and the communication. And that not only needs to take place from an internal perspective, but it also needs to be a part of the branding within that organization so that the community knows that this is an initiative that they're going to stand on and they really mean it because it's important for the workforce to reflect the, the community there within. You know, that's important. So they want to be you know, pioneers in that area on the diversity, equity, inclusion front, not only from an internal, but for an external uh, uh, perspective as well. Yeah, absolutely agree. Hannah, any thoughts you have on this regard? I think I would just kind of um, expand a little bit upon the comment I made earlier about not being reactive. Um, so whenever there's We've seen a lot of things occur over the last few years um, on a national um, scale where there's things that have happened, you know, that 
have put a lot of companies in more of a reactive mode. Um, and you've seen, you know, companies have really big campaigns around things that we've been reacting to, but how many companies have really implemented sustainable yeah. culture shifts within their organizations? And I can say that I'm proud to be a part of an organization that most certainly um, prior to and, um, you know, currently, we definitely have a culture of um, that I feel it's most certainly the a culture that I am proud to be a part of that embraces DEI. Um, but how many I've, I've just looked across the nation and I'm, I've seen so many just very abrupt and sudden um, DEI initiatives. And I just wonder how many of them will be sustainable. So I think that that's just something to look for. And and just to be aware of um, how many will sustain themselves and, and how many are just reactive and more just there to kind of, you know, show some type of awareness to their employees and to the public, um, but are they true DEI initiatives? Yeah, gr great suggestions and reflections. I, I will add from CHG's perspective, you know, I think I learned um, early on in standing up our program you have, we talk about courage as a DEI practitioner, but the courage also is in relation to saying we have to go slow to go fast. And so, you know, we know we're always under a lot of pressure to do more and more and more. That's what feels performative, but to really have a lasting, sustainable, long-term DEI strategy, it takes time to stand it up. And so having the courage to hold your critics at bay and say, we're doing this the right way and we're doing it for the long haul. And so we, we need you to hang with us here. It, it's, I'm glad in hindsight that we took that strategy, but it was not easy to do. Um, so it sounds like we've all sort of had similar experiences in this space. Um, staying in the vein of authenticity, um, you know, another way we demonstrate our authenticity and commitment to the work is by the relationships we build within our different communities. Um, Hannah, I know you've been pretty community minded and involved for quite some time. Um, why are community relationships so important to DEI and what advice would you have for our audience members on what they can do in that space? I think that it is critical to be involved in your community if you're looking to specifically around the work that I've done in my career is recruitment, um, specifically around physicians. And if you look back over the last 10, 15 years, the population of those going into um, careers as physicians has changed um, drastically. In fact, um, it's shifted to around 40 something percent females going into medical school. So you can imagine what that might look like. Um, the partners of those who are going into um, medical school, the partners are you know, male, female. It's looking very different, the demographic around what that might look like for you know, the career path of folks who are you know, significant others of those who are finishing. So you might have um, folks who are also in dual careers. So you have physicians marrying physicians or you know, high powered couples who dual career paths. So you're looking to be ingrained in the community. You want to, as a recruiter, find out what is going on in your community. You need to develop relationships with the chambers of commerce, the bankers to help you know, connect the physician spouses who are coming in to interview, you're not just recruiting the physician, you're recruiting the entire family. Um, you need to get to know, um, is there ballet, theater, um, sports available? Even the things you might not think about, getting involved in like, is there um, programs for children with special needs? I recruited a physician family who, um, actually several um, physician families with children um, who had special needs and I happened to know about what was available in our community. And just having a presence in the community will allow for you to better connect your physicians and their families and recruit that entire family unit because it's not just the physician who's making a decision. A majority of the time, and in fact, a lot of research shows 80% of the time, it's the physician partner, physician spouse, who's making the decision on where they will live because they're looking for a career and they're gonna be ingrained in the community as well even more so than that physician who's gonna be just going to the hospital every day. Um, so you're looking to recruit the entire family unit. 
Um, so it's very important to be ingrained in the community, know it's available in the community, um, and just have that connection to the community and give back. Um, so I think it's it's important to kind of have that connection because the community is going to help you recruit that physician. Yeah, so this sweat equity doesn't end within your organizational structure. You actually then yeah. have to continue and extend it outside your walls. And it it makes complete sense. That's the community you're serving. Um, yeah. And so and being it's the an diversity member, around it. It's it's not just knowing, it's being authentic with your physician you're recruiting. You're not just recruiting, you know, a, a Caucasian male. You're recruiting um, diverse populations of providers. You want to recruit diversity. So you need to know where you want to be involved with and know, is there a mosque? Is there a temple? You know, what is available in my community for the diverse population that I'm wanting to attract? Because you're physician population that you're looking at, they will know if they are being interviewed by someone who doesn't know about the community and the community that they're wanting to be recruited to. And if you seem like someone who's not authentic and doesn't know what's available and you only know about that church that's on that corner for that one specific population, they may not want to join that type of community. Um, so you definitely need to be ingrained in your community and know about what's available for all yeah. people. Completely agree. Um, Jessica, Russ, what would you add? Any experiences you had in, in working with your communities, um, developing relationships? Most certainly. I think it's important to, you know, take it a step outside of our, our roles, even in recruitment, you know, giving back to the community as well, positioning yourself as a community subject matter expert and being a resource to people outside of your organization. So volunteer, you volunteering, you know, being a panelist, you know, for your local community schools and going in and, you know, working with students, those things are important for for experience exposure so that we can increase diversity and starting even, you know, at a younger age. So when you go into the community and you're, you know, being a part of what's going on around you, it'll allow you to be able to kind of build future workforces moving forward. Completely agree. I actually had a recruiter and I, I, I don't know if I can add to any more to what my two colleagues have, have said so well, but I did uh, want to point out I had a, a recruiter that absolutely sealed a placement uh, because of his engagement with the university's music program because the family's child had a specialized type of violin training course that they were involved in. Rare type, I think it's called a Suzuki violin. Uh, and it was only after, it was only because that recruiter was already engaged with that university's department, they were aware of him. We were able to connect the mom and the young prodigy to the uh, university's music director, and it was done after that. So uh, uh, Hannah and, and Jessica are absolutely correct. That never would have happened had that recruiter not invested himself in the weeds of that community. They were aware of what he had to offer, and, and he, he re recruited an entire family for the entire community. Uh, and you can only do that when you're engaged in the community. Absolutely. What a great example to illustrate that is authenticity. You're you're actively in the work. And that's that's how you break through that. I love that example. And I, I think similarly, um, there's great opportunities through your volunteerism programs, through your organizations. You know, we offer volunteer time off at CHG every year, and we're actively looking for nonprofit partners in the diverse diversity, equity, and inclusion space so that we can provide opportunities to our employees to go out and serve and get involved in their communities. So I think that is a, a really interesting and compelling element to DEI strategy that is often overlooked. And so I really appreciate each of you um, articulating why that is so important um, and to not overlook building relationships within your communities. So in addition to kind of what we've talked about so far, you know, we know that once we gain buy-in and we're developing our strategic plans and gaining uh, relationships, we also have to take a really critical look internally into our own policies and procedures and practices um, that we're implementing every day to make sure that we are actively eliminating implicit bias, um, of course, in our hiring and our promotional processes, but frankly, throughout our, our people processes in, in any organization. So I'd like you guys to talk to us a little bit about 
Um, how does impl implicit bias show up in our hiring practices? Um, and Hannah, if I can start with you, what, what have you seen happen in that space? Um, I think that what I've seen in my career is that um, so often the top layer um, in many organizations, do rem it does remain the same. Mm. And that's because the individuals in that spot um, become very comfortable and they typically turn over when there's either um, a retirement um, or unfortunately a passing, a passing um, and a lack of a succession plan. And I hate to say that, um, but we fail to plan yeah. um, or we just say we're planning and we continue to plan, but yeah. without a succession plan. <laughs> Um, and when we fail to do that, um, we fail to plan for diversifying um, as it pertains to gender um, and race. Yeah. And then we don't have a plan. Um, so I think that it's important for all of us to consider um, a succession plan and having a real goal. So when we have a measurable goal that we can plan for, um, we can think about in five years, I want to diversify by gender and um, race, you know, 30% of my top leadership. If you do that, then you can have a measurable goal and you can look at it and say, this is, have I done this? And you can see, did I reach my goal? We don't do that. And I think we don't do it for a lot of different reasons. Um, but I think it's something that we should kind of look at examine ourselves and look at why why are we not doing that yeah I completely agree I think you know I've observed um rightfully so we spend a lot of energy on the talent acquisition and recruitment and hiring and that's a critical component of course but if you're not applying the similar amount of effort and focus on how you're retaining, engaging, growing, and, and ultimately retiring your workforce, you're going to continually be battling <laughs> your, your desires for representation. So I think, you know, these next couple of minutes talking more broadly about kind of how does implicit bias show up? Um, how does it affect our hiring stage? Kind of what have we seen in terms of moving people through the organization, succession planning and offboarding? So let's build on that a little bit more. Russ, I know you've seen um, through all of your experience, implicit bias kind of show up in a lot of different areas. Let's talk about in the hiring stage. Do you have an exam examples for us of where you've seen organizations struggle overlooking maybe qualified candidates being passed over. Talk to us a little bit about your experience there. Very, very good point. Uh, uh, and this is one of the ways where the, the cultural norm kind of gets disturbed by unwritten policy or bias when it comes to uh, uh, candidates. And we had one case where we were recruiting, uh, I want to say it was for an oncology position at a rural location. Uh, and of course, we meet with the hiring managers to make sure we have all the particulars of what they're looking for in candidates. And I'm, I'm kind of reviewing uh, recruiter productivity and notice that there have been 16 candidates referred to this particular search. Uh, and none of those candidates were considered beyond the initial CV screening and all that kind of good stuff. Turns out that uh, each of those candidates represented an ethnic diverse, uh, an ethnic group that was not good, uh, of the hiring manager. Uh, and I had to have a discussion with that hiring manager because we were expending resources and all that kind of good stuff to actually find qualified candidates. And uh, I, I had a very good discussion with running through each of the candidates I had presented and having the hiring manager kind of give me an explanation as to what was it about this candidate that didn't meet your needs for clinical direct patient care. After about the third candidate, he exactly knew where I was on it. And uh, I had to kind of take a stance as, a, as an exec and say, well, here's the deal. Um, uh, we're probably gonna have to withhold further support for this search until you begin to entertain the diverse candidate pool we present to you that represents the qualifications, expectations, competencies that you've told us that were most important to you. Um, that was a game change. Honestly, after about two weeks, so uh, once the executive of that hospital learned that we had kind of pulled back our support, wanting to know why, that was another candid conversation we had, but it allowed that executive to 
um, re-emphasize and, and refresh and refocus that executive's imperative on having a diverse provider workforce. And uh, we kind of got matters taken care of, but it showed up in a very real way to the disappointment of about 16 providers that didn't get considered because of the manager's uh, 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 implicit bias. Well, that's such a great practical example, Russ. So we talked earlier about using data and how do you use data to identify where you have the opportunity areas and start the conversations. And in your case, it sounds like that had the desired result. And in my experience as well, it's kind of one conversation at a time. And um, that's back to this is a long, <laughs> it's a long game we're all playing here. But I couldn't agree more with the concept of using data to identify the gap and then having conversations, open candid conversations about the root causes. Um, Jessica, um, anything you would add to this? I would like to add that um, just as Russ stated that, you know, presenting the data is very important. And, and that's also why the messaging from C-suite needs to be consistent, because when you look at these things as well, it can also uh, have legal ramifications yeah. as well that could be detrimental to the organization. So, you know, you look at in, internal promotions or if it was an internal search. So it's so many things that can be negatively impacted when we allow our implicit bias to take control of our decision making. So it's important to bring all parties together and like Russ said, have those conversations, show them the metrics, show them the data so that they can see how the organization will ultimately be impacted. Yeah, that's great. So Jessica, I'm going to stay with you. Can So let's, let's double click a little bit more into that. So we're talking about kind of how do we ensure people across the organization have opportunities to grow, um, advance, increase representation, regardless of where they sit. Do you have some examples, some methods you've used in your organization that have shown to be successful in that regard? Yes, ma'am. So the, or, uh, the organization I currently work with has done an amazing job for over 30 years of really uh, being on that diversity, equity, inclusion, you know, uh, train. And what they have done is actually develop their own internal leadership training opportunities. And, and that, like Russ talked about, make it transparent, make it visible. So even in our pitches, when we're recruiting and resourcing candidates, that is going to be a topic of discussion with those candidates to let them know we're invested into your success and your growth within this organization. So we're very transparent about what that process looks like, connecting them with other clinical leaders within the organization so that they can tell them their route and their success story. So they know exactly what it will take to grow within the organization. And that's allowed our organization to really have that hyper growth that we've experienced over the last years. So I think it's very important going in knowing that there is a succession plan and there is a career path versus saying, okay, if I come in and I do well, then I might be promoted. You know, that happens a lot within organizations, but when it's plain, there is something there that allow you to get that coaching, that development and that training, you really get more buy-in. Yeah, I completely agree. And I'll, I'll kind of bring data back up. I think, you know, we're, we have probably the most robust data when it comes to recruiting and hiring. Um, it gets a little harder, you know, at least for CHG as we move into our moving people through the pro promotional process. Um, so for our audience, I think just recognizing there continually has to be a development of new data so that you can understand current state and, and identify how to help shoot troubleshoot those areas that you're not seeing the results you look for so for instance we just created a new report um, around promotional rates and we are able to kind of monitor and assess across the organization the rates of promotion across a number of demographic factors and really again to the hiring example russ shared take a surgical approach into where do, where can we uncover there's differences in the rate of promotion so i think data enablement is becoming more and more crystal clear to me that you have to have actionable data to be able to move some of these things. A great example. Um, thank you so much for that, Jessica. Um, Hannah, anything you would add in terms of kind of succession planning? Um, you know, you mentioned kind of some of the senior folks at the top of the organizational um, structure. You know, what, are, what would you add to this part of the conversation? I think I'm gonna add an experience that I've personally had and and saw happen previously, not with this employer. Um, 
it's so easy to treat people who look like us differently or treat them different than we would people who don't look like us. So I think we have to have the courage to examine our own behavior and think about, am I treating this person? So being in a leadership role, am I treating this person who looks like me differently than I'm treating this person who doesn't look like me? And we have to have the courage to examine our own behavior. And I think that so many times we don't look at that because it's so easy and comfortable to treat people who look like us mm -hmm. um, differently than we do people who don't look like us. And I saw that person um, move up through the ranks very quickly. Um, I'm talking about people who looked the same. And for someone who didn't look, I didn't look like them at all. Um, it was so disheartening because I knew that I was working really hard and and putting in all that time and effort and and you know I saw this person who I was doing a lot of their their work and and um, and not getting that same you know upward mobility and it was so disheartening and I don't want to ever do that to someone else and I know I have to have the courage to examine my own behavior so I would just. Um, want to make sure that we all have the courage to do that. Um, so we all need to, to just always keep that in front of mind because it's so easy to kind of, to fall into that, you know, you're, it's so comfortable to treat someone um, differently just because they look like us. We're always looking to, oh, am I treating this person differently because they don't look like us? Yeah, that's a great point. <laughs> yeah, it's it's always like, oh, well, they don't look like us and they're different. So That's I need right. to make sure I'm not treating them differently. It's less noticeable when you're talking it's about your own It's less noticeable when we're yeah. treating them differently because they do look like us. That's right. So it's, it's just, we need to kind of look at the flip side of the coin and make sure that we're not going too far on the other side as well so yeah that's great just thank to make you sure, so much <laughs> yeah just want to make sure i leave us with that thought as well because i will give us one example um and i've talked to a couple of people about this because it's a funny example kind of but and not funny all at the same time but um i'm half indian and a private practice called me once and they they asked me hey, Hannah, we're interviewing an Indian candidate who's coming in. It was a physician candidate. They said, you know, should we, we need to take them out to a vegetarian restaurant and what other Indian doctors do you think we should invite? And I just was like, what, you know, very, just wanting to make sure I politic in a politically correct way answered their question, but didn't offend them at all. And was like, no, no, hold on, you know, let me call this candidate and find out more about them. And once I did, I realized, whoa, you know, this candidate, you know, eats meat, is yeah. from the US, would be not interested in going to an Indian restaurant, loves Italian food. Mm. We need to only invite the referring physicians, which would be general surgery, um, general surgeons and primary care like, please, we do not need to offend this candidate by just inviting a bunch of Indian doctors and taking them to a vegetarian restaurant. Yeah. So, you know, we need to be thinking, do you, we need to treat everyone the same, yes. regardless if yes. they look like us or they don't look like us. Yeah. Um, so anyways, that's, that's my last little, um, my, I just wanted to leave us with that. Cause yes. I think that it's so easy to look at someone and say, oh, they're, they're Indian. Let's invite a bunch of Indian people to dinner. Yeah. Or we forget that, oh, this person looks like me. You know, we're just, this is a colleague. And we forget that we're actually treating them differently than we yes. would treat someone else. And we're moving them up quickly through the ranks. And yeah. there's a person that looks like me, you know, at the wayside, who's just waiting for an opportunity and they never get to advance. Uh, it's such a great reminder. And, you know, I think uh, I it, it leaves me kind of just realizing again, how critically important emotional intelligence and self awareness is not just for us as practitioners, but across our organizations and communities. So really important reminders. So we've talked quite a bit about 
you know, everything from hiring to promotion, succession planning, et cetera. Um, I want to, my last question, I want to um, talk about a different area that isn't often brought up in, in DEI discussions. So let's talk about something that affects everything we do every day, diversity of thought. Um, Jessica, would you mind telling us what diversity of thought is and why it is so important to consider in your DEI efforts? So diversity of thought is just the concept of you know, appreciating everybody's opinion, everybody's thoughts, whether that you agree with them or not. You know, everybody has had experiences that have shaped who they are up until this point. And those things can be valuable. Just like Hannah said, you don't want to assume what a person's experience has been personally or professionally just because we may identify with that person. You want to, that's where relationship building comes in. You want to get to know that person and just ask just treat them as any other individual that you are getting to know and find out, you know, where they grew up, what their family dynamics was like, you know, schools, things like that, that shaped who they are today, things that they are. Uh, you know, are passionate about. And it'll, a lot of times you'll have that light bulb go off, that aha moment where you can see, you know, where the personality comes from or, you know, yeah. their 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 uh, opinions about things. And it, it kind of softens the, the mood. But if you go in with a preconceived notion of who this person is, I think it sets everybody up for failure. Yeah. I'm passionate about this topic. I think, um, you know, we we at CHG have leaned into Myers Briggs as one way for us to better understand. You know, we may look the same, but I'm going to approach this completely differently than you will. But that's personality driven or thought driven. So it's yeah, it's an often overlooked, but I think critical component to DEI. Um, Russ, Jess, any uh, sorry, Russ, um, Hannah, anything you would add on diversity of thought? I'd love to add here uh, because the, the diversity of thought and experience and perspective is probably, as you said, probably the most overlooked piece of the inclusion discussion. Uh, but I liken it to this, uh, when you have a, a, a space where diversity of perspective is welcomed, it's like adding seasoning to your favorite dish. Yeah. Uh, it's like multiple seasonings to, it's like soul fooding, <laughs> fooding the organization, if you will. It's like adding multiple layers of different types of seasoning to the organization. And it adds, it adds flavor to the organization. It adds substance to the organization. And, and it creates, uh, I believe it actually creates uh, what, I, what I kind of like sort of the law space of civility. Uh, mm. Because we know that every voice at the table is a voice worth hearing, and otherwise you wouldn't be at the table. Uh, so th that's that's so important, and, and uh, I just can't speak enough about the, the type of help an organization or divisions within an organization have uh, when there is a diversity of perspective, different ways of thinking things. Doesn't mean it's wrong or right. Doesn't mean it's good or bad. It's different, and it's yeah. different seasonings that make the entire dish. Rock. <laughs> well, I love your analogy, but admittedly, we're doing this over lunch, so you kind of made me hungry. But... <laughs> I'm sorry about that. <laughs> Loved your analogy, Russ. That's a, a great way to think about it and put it. So I could talk to you all day long. This has been such a great conversation. We do have some questions from our audience, and we've left some time at the end of the webinar so we could um, address those. So I'd like to start with a question from Kevin Hardy. So how can you measure whether or not a healthcare organization's DEI program is working or not working? Are there penalties if a company says they have a DEI program but actually have no data to validate? Would anybody like to tackle that one? I can jump in, you know, if there is no change, you know, you don't see anything different from, you know, the workforce perspective, you don't, know, like we're talking about people coming in the organization that have a different mindset, that bring a different flavor, that bring, you know, a different value add to that organization. If you see that kind of stall and remain the same, then you know those diversity, equity, inclusion initiatives may not be effective at that time. If there is no, you know, growth within the organization from promotional standpoint. So it's several things. And I think representation is a key determining factor as to how successful that organization is being with their uh, their initiatives. That's great. Russ, Hannah, anything you would add? 
Uh, I think this goes kind of back to how it's communicated, uh, uh, how milestones are acknowledged and recognized, and how transparent uh, the, uh, the, the everything is. Jess is exactly correct. If we said that we ought to see some changes, uh, and, and again, with respect to the type of work it takes to do that, some types of cultural norms you have to kind of push through, uh, some initiatives might take a little bit longer than others to actually see tangible results. But even if even if employees, even if staff is beginning to see a shift in how we think and embrace, and that starts with an opening of ideas and thoughts and having those types of forums where we can kind of lay out tangible, actionable strategies around uh, uh, this diversity, this inclusion discussion. But at the end of the day, if an organization sets out a, uh, a, a goal, a list of goals in the diversity, equity, inclusion space, and one to two years later, you're not even seeing it on the front end of recruitment with diverse or training programs that allow folks that are within the middle managerial area of the organization to kind of progress upward, then uh, that's going to be that it, you won't need anything else. You won't even need data. I mean, because the optics and the, uh, the objective reality shows us what exactly uh, how much of an imperative this is for the business. Yeah, absolutely. Hannah? I would have to agree with what Russ just said, it's, um, it goes back to the measurable goals. If you can say, and it goes back to kind of what I was saying earlier about the, um, you know, the C-suite saying, oh, this is what we're doing to address, you know, whatever's happening in the nation at the time. And then they have a plan, but they continue to plan and yeah. they have no measurable goals. And they're, they're just kind of saying things. If they're never reaching a measurable goal, then they're probably just, you know, saying things. So yeah. I would just um, have to always go with what can be measured. Yeah. And if you're you're able to reach your measurable goals with at an organization, um, then clearly you're making progress. If you're not, then you're just continuing to plan the plan. Yeah, I, I agree with all of you. And I, I think also I would add, um, you know, our on our strategic plan, we created a pillar focused just on our commitment and creating kind of an investment strategy and governance structure. And, you know, and your goals aren't aren't always data-driven goals. They're milestone attainment and progress towards your initiative. So I would say just the the penalty, there was a question about the penalties. The penalties are we've got a pretty savvy um, society anymore. And, and if you're performative, it's going to show up pretty quickly and you're, you're going to you're going to deal with those consequences. It's, it's a really great question. Um, let's take another um, question from our audience. So what are some actionable initiatives that an organization should start with? So someone who's just beginning their journey, what, what advice would you have around actionable steps that someone can take? I, I could probably uh, begin here. I, I think it's important uh, that we not rush to hire a chief diversity officer, officer uh, that kind of comes across as more performative than anything else. Uh, I think it's very important for uh, the, the leaders of the organization to state clearly what their inclusion and diversity goals are and immediately start where you are and begin to engage, whether in focus groups, uh, you can have folks kind of lead uh, your, your employees and the staff in discussions. I think it really begins with understanding where you are currently as an organization on the diversity, equity, and inclusion scale. And the best way to kind of determine that absence of data is kind of get a sense of what your committed uh, uh, staff, uh, 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 how they view things, see things, how they've experienced things, even as employees of that organization, that there was never really a forum to actually kind of bring to the table and discuss. This, this gives everyone, I think, kind of a, a collective ownership in creating this diverse culture, an inclusive culture Everyone takes ownership of it. And just like performative acts from corporate levels, those that generally buck against it uh, will kind of be considered the performative ones in this uh, new cultural reshift, this cultural shifting. So I, I think it's really important to kind of clarify what it is we want to do and, be, and immediately begin uh, 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 engaging uh, those that are, are taking care of business for you to, to help creating 
the, 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 the diversity, diversity inclusive, inclusive climate for the organization. Yeah, I've, I've seen a lot of um, companies move too quickly through the, those early stages of why does this work matter to us? Um, I would add, I think, you know, for those of you that are just starting, I would recommend really spend some time looking at your culture, your values, your purpose, and really understanding how does this work align with and complement and support our existing culture and what we're trying to achieve as an organization. And that's the approach we took. And I feel now 18 plus months in, it's really served us well because it is authentic to who we are. It's not a separate thing over here. So my advice to the questioner is don't move too quickly through understanding what that means. That will stand the test of time and help you with longevity. Um, really great question. Jessica, anything you would add? I just second both of you guys' sentiment, you know, don't rush the process, really get the boots on the ground, you know, get your feelers out with your existing workforce, determine how they see the organization, because we can learn a lot from the people that are there. Again, we assume a lot that people are happy in their roles. We assume that people may not want to be promoted. So we need to find out what the, what people really want with, you know, within their existing space. Absolutely. Okay, hey, I think we've got time for one more question and it's a nice segue, um, which is how long does it take to implement a successful DEI program if everyone is on board at every level? Would three to five years be a reasonable expectation? Wow, uh, I think it depends on the size of the organization and the commitment of uh, especially executive and uh, mid-level managers to be champions uh, of this, um, uh, yeah, and, that's, and again, we're talking about a 350,000 employee organization that I'm a part of, and uh, we're still working on being careful to organically diffuse and improve on our own diversity uh, a workforce effort. So it takes it takes a while, but I think the most important thing is to uh, not. I think it's important to have some times where you can actually mark and look back at as an organization to see how far we've come. Uh, but I think it's even more important than that to make sure the efforts uh, are organic, make sure that the efforts uh, are, are, are really designed to not just lack on performative, 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 uh, and, and cause it, uh, and demonstrate those as potential wins, but to actually move methodically, move intentionally uh, and be able to designate times you can look back as an organization and see how well you've matched against whatever your measurable uh, goal was. Uh, that creates buy-in, uh, it creates uh, um, more inclusion from those that have been on the fray to make sure that we're really doing something authentically and with great intent, not performative. Uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't get so locked up on if it's not done by this year or if it's not done within 12 months, we're just going to completely scrap it. This is cultural change. It's corporate change that is best uh, sustained when it's when it's organically diffused. That's right. Yeah, I think culture is it's never you're never done. You're never done with DEI. You're never done with culture. Right. So these are these done correctly are long standing initiatives within your company. I, I will say, having just walked us through our own journey, what I would respond to the audience member is, you know, you need to create a multi year phased approach. Um, that's often where people get overwhelmed with what they need to do. So we created a three to five year strict strategic plan. And then you narrow it down to, okay, that's what we want to do in five years, but what do we want to do this year? And you got to be able to zoom out to the long-term plan and then zoom back in to what can we do today? And it's not easy to do. <laughs> so I'm, I'm not going to suggest that's easy, but I would say that's, that's the right way to think about standing up um, a new program. Um, Hannah, Jessica, anything else you would add? I think taking... Um, I don't want to call it baby steps, but taking steps that are measurable in the right direction and not biting off more than you can chew um, is take, putting things in the right perspective and going in the right direction. I think that you want to um, have 
things that you guys can celebrate together as an organization. And Russ said that earlier, you know, be able to reflect and say, yes, we were here, now we're here, and be able to celebrate, you know, right. your milestones and where you were and, you know, how far you've come um, and have those goals where you can say, this is what we're doing. And as an organization, celebrate those together. So I think as, as long as you're moving in the right direction and you have those goals, then that's what, and that's a great thing. That's right. And know it's the long game. So just be prepared. <laughs> it's exactly. having some resiliency and uh, sort of eyes wide open that there's going to be setbacks and wins and, you know, you just got to stay at it. Um, well, this has been such an engaging conversation and I'm thrilled we've had such a wonderful audience and some great questions coming in through the Q&A button. We are not going to have time, unfortunately, to address all of the questions that have been submitted to us, but we will be re uh, distributing the webinar recording and then the CHG team will work with Healthy Careers and our panelists on getting you responses for those of you that asked questions in the chat um, given that we won't have time to get to everything today. So before we wrap, um, panelists, is there any last word of advice or encouragement you would offer to our audience members who are out there fighting the good fight and doing this difficult work? Be genuine, be authentic to who you are, and be consistent, and it will work out in the end. That's beautiful. I needed that, Jessica. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Raz, Hannah, what would you like to leave our audience with? Uh, I would just say, especially to my provider recruitment colleagues out there, is uh, begin to kind of envision yourself as the perhaps conduit that would uh, help introduce and facilitate these types of discussions with the key decision makers in your organization. Uh, I believe we should, uh, we represent that type of influence uh, that can influence organizational change. So kind of embrace it, bro. That's right. I love that. Hannah, what about you? I think I want to leave us with um, something I said earlier, that it takes courage for us to examine our own behaviors and um, to make change, it takes each and every one of us, not just an organizational head. So I think if every single one of us examined our own behaviors and treated everyone um, the way that we would want to be treated, and we treated everyone the same, then we could really make a shift um, just in the way everyone gets treated in the world. So. Well, that would be wonderful. I, I hope we can achieve that goal, Hannah. Um, so panelists, I can't thank you enough. Again, on behalf of CHG and Healthy Careers, we're so grateful for your participation. Audience members, thank you so much. We know everyone has very busy day jobs. So taking the time to talk with us and, and share ideas and practices is, is really important to all of us. So we hope you've all found this to be a valuable experience. Um, we will be receiving a recording. And again, thank you all for joining us today. I loved our conversation and I learned a, definitely learned a few things that I'm going to apply. So panelists, audience, thank you so much. Hey, have a wonderful day. Bye.